I'll move out of your way. Well, welcome everyone. Um, I'm so pleased to see all of you and also to be able to welcome our speaker today, uh, Mr. Katubi, who is our own graduate, one of our uh, most successful graduates, a partner at Jones Day in Washington, D.C. And uh, I won't invite you all to go visit him there, but you should at least visit the premises of, uh, of, <laughs> of Jones Day there. The building is like a national monument. It is so beautiful. Um, so he is here to talk to us about the role of the global lawyer, and we are so interested in having this uh, conversation. He has agreed to take some of your questions, so he'll be speaking till about 1.15, and we'll devote the last 15 minutes or so to audience questions and, um, and comments. And I promise my colleague, Professor Brand, who unfortunately is out of the country um, once again, to mention in my introduction that, uh, that Charles Kachubi was his very own research assistant when he was here, and he was really good. <laughs> and one more thing, um, Austin Lebo will be circulating, for those of you who are in Professor Brand's class, the attendance sheet, so be sure to sign it. And with that, I will turn over the floor to Mr. Kachubi. Great. Uh. Okay, is that okay? You got it? All right. Uh, advance apologies. I'm going to try to do some PowerPoint and short video. Um, I usually don't like to do this, but I thought it was good to have something up on the screen to guide to, to show you where I'm heading with everything. So if I fumble a bit, um, apologies. So I always like to start with something a bit provocative uh, when I talk at, at a law school or really anywhere. And here's my introduction, introductory provocation today. Um, everyone from a fruit stand owner in Tunisia to a corporate judgment debtor in Ecuador knows that uh, official bias, corruption, and fraud are terribly corrosive forces on the rule of law. But the unfortunate reality, and this is something that's going to probably pervade most of my comments today, the unfortunate reality is that both are surprisingly common around the world. It's probably an understatement to say that half of the world's popu population lives in a system of justice that has no, uh, no hope, no semblance for the rule of law. Now, various NGOs around the world have made these color-coded maps. You can find these online, simple Google search. This is Transparency International. Um, the red countries are really corrupt and bad ones, and the yellow countries are less corrupt. And when you stand back, the view is incredibly depressing because the entire world looks red. But that's just a simple reality. Um, sovereigns in most places around the world have failed their citizenry. Now, in this day and age, uh, and in my experience, the best lawyers, uh, best international lawyers, are no longer confined by their bar cards. Um, sovereigns no longer have an absolute monopoly on the rule of law. We as lawyers are aggregators and facilitators of the rule of law. It's our job to move legal rights, assets, people, uh, across borders, and it's our job to bring the rule of law wherever our clients go. I'm barred in Pennsylvania and D.C., for instance, but on a regular basis, and this is a short list in the past two years, I've worked very closely with laws and judicial processes in Ecuador, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Botswana, Uganda, Nigeria, Uzbekistan, and Kazakhstan, and that's in the past few years. The reality is we have clients going to these places around the world, and it's our job to bring the rule of law with them. Now, NGO lawyers and very well-intentioned law professors uh, for years and years have fortunately evangelized the virtues of due process and the rule of law, mostly in the form of legal reform, drafting constitutions, drafting laws. Um, the results of these efforts, however, are only as good as the officials that enact, imply, and enforce them. I was talking with Ali about this before, before my remarks. Um, the Venezuelan Constitution, for instance, uh, here's a quote. It says that all judicial and administrative actions shall be subject to due process and that the country is governed by the rule of law. 
as the one of the most famous uh, arbitrators these days, John Paulson, said in a now famous speech he gave at the University of Richmond, this is worse than a falsity. It's a fraud. Uh, so due process everywhere is universally guaranteed these days. It, it, it truly is. It's universally guaranteed. And fraud and corruption are universally condemned, at least on paper. The problem, and I'll speak some my, my own uh, personal experiences with this, is that there is little tradition and even less temerity around the world for a robust investigation and enforcement of these things. Judicial misdeeds go unpunished all the time. Official corruption is rampant. And when these things remain under the shroud of darkness, no aspirational constitutional provision can help it. Now, to fill the void you see between the yellow and the red states here, a lot of countries are stepping up. The US and the UK are the leading evangelists of due process and the rule of law and applying our laws extraterritorially to hopefully change things. Uh, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, for instance, and the UK equivalent thereof tries to govern our citizens when they go abroad and make sure that they're not offering bribes and they're abiding by uh, commercial morality and so forth. But the whim of an overtaxed prosecutor trying to regulate our citizens overseas can only go so far. Uh, that is why, in my experience today, much of this is left to private lawyers, private parties and their lawyers uh, around the world to uncover fraud and corruption and so forth. I mean, we, global lawyers, and our clients are the main protagonists around the world in the court systems. Uh, so that's why we are sometimes the best suited to oversee and correct these sovereign processes when they go awry. You know, once upon a time, and this was probably the case when I was in law school 15 years ago, is litigants flocked to US courts like moths to a light. Uh, that's not the case as much anymore. It's, you know, pulling Supreme Court pulling back on jurisdiction and extraterritoriality, uh, punitive damages are being limited. Plaintiffs are happy to go overseas and litigate issues in foreign courts, sometimes very far flung and very red foreign courts, and then trot the world with the judgment trying to enforce, which is becoming very so much easier as assets move around the world. And in places where this sort of judicial bias and corruption are difficult to uncover, it becomes very problematic for the rule of law that these sorts of big cases find themselves in all sorts of, of uh, different courts. First sort of trend I want to talk about today is something that is uh, a new mechanism that's become available to US lawyers, or a lot of lawyers, to sort of help fill this gap between uh, the red states and the yellow states. Has anyone ever heard of Section 1782 of the U.S. Code? 28 U.S.C. 1782. I'm sure you have. It's a remarkable statute that has been on the books for about decades. But it's only become used very, very recently. In broad summary, it allows a private party to enlist the aid of a U.S. court to order U.S. style discovery here in the United States in aid of a proceeding overseas. This is an incredible mandate for a creative global lawyer worried about fraud and corruption for his clients abroad. You know, by filing, receiving, or even contemplating legal action abroad, he or she can serve a target of discovery in the United States with a US subpoena, be it a litigant, an opposing lawyer, simple custodian of records or an uninvolved witness. And the doors of the US courthouse open up. And with it, the full panoply of US discovery in aid of proceedings that are happening elsewhere. In practical effect, you can get evidence, discovery, that is anywhere around the world with no action pending here at all in ways that I won't go into here. US courts are empowered under this statute to provide broader assistance to foreign courts then they provide to their own sister courts in the United States. Uh, in the past few years under this statute, I've obtained documentary evidence of wrongdoing in Nigeria to submit to Nigerian authorities. Contract breaches in Kurdistan, which we submitted to the London High Court. And judicial impropriety in Ecuador, which was eventually used in Ecuadorian proceedings and in arbitration before The Hague. 
Um, this was all done before U.S. courts. And that's going to lead to my first war story here today. Has anyone ever heard of the Chevron Ecuador case? It's kind of all over the news for a while. I'm sure some people here have heard about it. Um, I was one of the, the lawyers for Chevron in that case. And very briefly, Chevron was sued in Ecuador um, by a group of Ecuadorian plaintiffs represented by U.S. lawyers. The company, for a while, sort of knew that um, the proceedings down there were a little bit fishy. There were some shady things going on, but they really didn't have a lot of proof of exactly the depth of the corruption in the Ecuadorian courts. So the plaintiffs, at the same time, commissioned a documentary. It was called Crude. Uh, a documentary of litigating in the Ecuadorian courts. Uh, Chevron's lawyers, myself being one of them, we, we, we watched the documentary, and someone, I still don't know who it was, noticed that the Netflix version was 13 seconds shorter than the Sundance version, the, the, the version of the Sundance Film Festival. So we, we compared the two, and what we saw was that the supposedly neutral court-appointed expert who had just recommended Chevron pay $18 billion in damages, was in the office of the Ecuadorian plaintiffs. This scene was cut out of the Netflix version. With that evidence, we opened up a Section 1782 proceeding in New York, where the, the, um, the documentary director resided, and got all of his outtakes. Uh, what we saw in those outtakes was truly amazing. The plaintiffs, the plaintiff's lawyers, the plaintiff's consultants, admitting on film and in emails about exactly what they were up to in Ecuador. And I'm going to play a quick clip of what we, the sort of things we saw when we watched the film. Plaintiff's North American lawyer, Stephen Donsker, believes that Ecuadorian courts are corrupt. All the judges here are There's a lot more, but I don't want to take up too much time. The point 
is, the point of this is that all of this evidence for an Ecuadorian proceeding was taken in the United States under this statute. Now this sort of evidence, when given to the courts in Ecuador, didn't really change much. That case continues today. But in the more typical case I have found, um, evidence like this, when submitted to authorities abroad, often plays a vital role in advancing the rule of law in places where it's needed most. Courts and authorities can consider it in enforcing their own laws and hopefully mold their civil judgments around a full explication of the facts, basic notions of fairness, and some sort of international minimum standard of due process. Justice Brandeis famously said that sunlight is among the best disinfectants. We, as private lawyers, with these sort of mechanisms, have become sort of the purveyors of sunlight uh, in places around the world where it's needed most. Now, the reality is, and as the, the Ecuadorian proceedings showed, not everyone wants this sort of sunlight. Uh, in my experience, a lot of courts around the world don't want this sort of wrongdoing exposed. In today's international world, though, justice tends to set sail. These sorts of issues, these sorts of cases, need to be recognized and enforced in courts around the world. This is not an idiosyncratic process recognition and enforcement of judgments. It's not a chauvinistic process. Uh, in this scenario, a national court judge dons the robes of a transnational jurist armed with a precept called international due process, which is Justice, uh, Judge Posner's, just a little bit of tongue, Judge Posner's um, description, description of recognition and enforcement. International due process. Should we refuse to enforce a judgment that doesn't abide by US service rules? No, we can't insist that every country around the world adopt every jot and tittle of U.S. civil procedure. That being said, can we enforce a judgment that one of the parties wrote themselves and bribed the judge to do so? Absolutely not. Tough cases fall in between. Now, no code or really judicial, no code, in, in fact, governs what international due process is. It doesn't turn on what American notions of due process is or even Western notions of due process. It's an international stand standard of due process. Uh, Hilton v. Guillaume, famous Supreme Court case, is probably the best descriptor of what international due process is. A fair and full trial, court of competent jurisdiction, citation or voluntary appearance of the, of, a, of the parties, an impartial administration of justice, no prejudice of the court, no fraud procuring the judgment. These are basics of international due process around the world. It should be in every court around the world. These should be the standards that govern civil cases. The result, however, when these sorts of cases, like the Ecuadorian case and many others, when they sort of start trotting around the world to be recognized and enforced, what happens is judges around the world, applying this basic standard, start to explicate what that standard is more. It starts to describe exactly what falls on the line of proper and improper. And what you have is lawyers, private lawyers, not bureaucrats, not lawmakers, not legislatures, deciding, or not deciding, guiding what constitutes international due process, what constitutes propriety, basic notions of a propriety around the world. And these cases, hopefully, guide future cases, resulting in a compliance pool towards the rule of law in a lot of the countries that don't have the tradition or temerity of the rule of law. They want their cases to be recognized and enforced around the world, hopefully when given the opportunity, these courts will change their decisions, they'll change their processes, they'll change their, um, their, their notion of justice so that they can be accepted, recognized, and enforced more. And that's one area where us as private lawyers play a role in crafting this international minimum standard of due process. Now, sophisticated parties, will opt out of that crimson red world altogether. And not to be chauvinistic here, most of these sophisticated parties will opt out of US courts too. A lot of, play, a lot of parties don't want to be in US courts at all. So what is becoming more popular is arbitration, contracting into arbitration before disputes arise. This process is even less parochial 
than transnational litigation. It's even less parochial than a recognition, recognition and enforcement action. It's truly, truly global. A um, few examples. I am presently representing a Canadian company suing Kazakhstan before a tribunal sitting in London comprised of U.S. and British arbitrators. The case is going to hearing next week in London. In another case, I represent a Turkish investor suing Uzbekistan before a tribunal in D.C. comprised of Bahraini, Brazilian, and Swiss arbitrators. I mean, this is an incredibly international process that is grounded really nowhere. But what happens in these sort of cases is there's a collision of traditions. The civil law and the common law collide quite a bit in these sort of cases. Uh, procedurally, they collide you know, as far as cross-examination. Um, the written decisions are very different between civil law and common law. And just the tone of the adv advocacy is very different between civil law and common law cases. But it's not just the process that collide in these sort of cases. It's the substance as well. English law used to be really the basis for all commercial arbitration. Uh, and we, we call it a, the, spine, the English law spine. It kind of runs through Canada, the United States, the UK, down through the Middle East, really through Russia, Singapore, Hong Kong. It's the English law spine that sort of connects the whole world. But at the same time, we can't expect a case between a French company and a Latin American state to be governed by English common law. I mean, the civil law has a role to play. So what we're seeing, what I'm seeing in a lot more commercial arbitration cases, is the resort to non-state law. Um, arbitrators are using concepts like good faith, uh, basic general concepts like estoppel, race judicata, pacta sunt servanda, contracts must be enforced. These sort of non-state concepts that are rarely grounded in no law, or looked at another way, are grounded in all law, are becoming the substantive norm for commercial arbitrations. And the reason arbitrators are doing this in these very, very international cases is really easy to discern. These sort of global norms apply uniformly, and they're not predicated in any, in any idiosyncrasies of national law. They remove sort of this colonial, appearance of colonial bias that used to pervade arbitration. And these sort of non-state concepts take due account for international discourse and cross-fertilization of ideas um, that may be unduly wedded to national law. Um, so where international due process, recognition and enforcement cases are providing a deep reserve of procedural principles, commercial arbitration is starting to form a deep reserve of normative principles that is governing, governing cases that are really international cases. And again, the theme I'm saying here is this, these normative principles are not being written by legislatures, bureaucrats, they're being written by you and I, private lawyers, on behalf of our clients who are going before arbitrators and hopefully guiding these cases and creating substantive norms that will apply in future cases. In the end, trying to equalize the vast differences among around the world. The last thing I want to talk about is really what, what I do um, daily is in investor state arbitration. How many here have a background in investor state arbitration or know what it is? I'm sure Professor Brand's class perhaps. Okay, um, a little bit of background. This is really the pinnacle of what people are calling governance without government. It finds its highest ebb in these sort of cases, and it's really sui generis. Many states have consented by treaty to arbitrate disputes with foreign investors in their countries. So while commercial arbitration is based upon a contract between two private parties, investor state arbitration is based upon a treaty. A state saying in a treaty, yes, we will arbitrate any disputes with investors of country X who poured money into our country and are thereafter wronged. This is a standing consent to arbitrate. And the most important part of this is, we all know what the active state doctrine is from Professor Brand's class or other classes. The active state doctrine is out the door. The point of these sort of cases is to adjudicate acts of state. Um, uh, in my experience, in my cases, I have launched proceedings against foreign governments regarding 
the regulations on import and export of hazardous materials, the conduct of a jury trial, a state settlement of environmental claims on behalf of its citizenry, the annulments of permits to construct an industrial plant, the legality of currency valuations. I mean, these are inherent sovereign acts that when foreign investors are wronged by these acts or suffer damages by these acts in what they see as an arbitrary manner, they can request arbitration, appoint private arbitrators to decide whether these sovereign acts are proper under international law. And these arbitrators don't apply national law. They don't apply national law of the host state. They don't apply national law of the investor state. Sometimes they do. Um, we'll get into that. But the point is, is they're applying international law. They're applying this concepts like fair and equitable treatment come up a lot. Fair and equitable treatment is akin to due process. It has a normative component. But it's grounded in an international minimum standard of what is proper. As, as Jan Paulson said, these cases aren't judged by a rule of law. They're supposed to be judged by the rule of law writ large. And this is a really massive power for private parties to have to be conferred upon them uh, by a treaty. Some writers have likened it to um, domestic judicial review that we've all learned about in our constitutional law classes. Um, it's really not dissimilar to cases like Martin versus Hunter's Lessee, which we all read in first year con law. Nowhere else have states established uh, this sort of regime for international review of their regulatory conduct. And again, this we, we private lawyers have the right to open up these cases and to advocate to judge these sovereign acts. Um, in a ways that benefit our clients, but hopefully in a ways that benefit the, the adherence to the rule of law around the world. There are presently 3,000 of these treaties uh, in, a for, in force around the world calling for compulsory arbitration um, against states. Uh, a few statistics. In the decade between 1995 and 2004, when investor state arbitration really came into its own, there were 30 times as many cases filed at ICSID, where these cases are heard, typically, than there were in the previous 30 years of the regime being in force. And since 2004, the case, the case statistics have only rocketed skyward. Uh, so the regime isn't really going anywhere. It has its detractors. It's not hard to get on Google and find out the, the scholars, the academics, who are really bemoaning investor state arbitration uh, as unfairly biased against sovereign interests, as really taking democracy out of this sort of regulatory decisions that states are making. But there is one undeniable benefit of the entire regime of this global constitutional review. Um, as states seek to avoid liability under these treaties in these arbitrations, there's a compliance pool towards the rule of law. Uh, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that these countries are changing the way they make their sovereign decisions. They're changing their court structures so they don't get sued uh, before these arbitrations. And that not only benefits multinational companies that are investing there, the hope is that benefits local participants in the process as well, as it brings these states into the fold of, um, into the, fold of the global community of states. So if you're one of, if your client is engaged in one of these very red states that we had up there on, on the previous map, we as lawyers um, want to know about these mechanisms that we can use for our clients to help bring an enclave of justice where there really isn't one. Now much of what I've said here has been focused on disputes resolution. Litigators, arbitrators, dispute counsel, like myself. But I readily admit that a lot of this begins with transactional counsel. And I know this is something that Professor Brand talks a lot about, is that transactional lawyers are really at the forefront of this. Uh, investment structuring, for example. There's no bilateral investment treaty between the United States and Nigeria. Nigeria is one of the very, very red states that we, that we see up there. And there's a lot of foreign investment between the United States and Nigeria. What good transactional counsel will do 
is they will route their investments through a place like the UK or the Netherlands, where there is an investment treaty in place, so that their investments are protected under international law. This is completely um, allowed in the regime of investor arbitration, investment arbitration. But the point is, is that transactional counsel are literally bringing, by doing that, by knowing that, by using this mechanism, they are literally bringing the rule of law with their client to these places where their clients are investing. So the transactional counsel is at the forefront of it. And that's not just for investments. If your client is engaged in cross-border transactions short of an investment, they're just contracts. Good transactional counsel have to know arbitration clauses. They have to know arbitration so that disputes can be taken out of the local courts and transactional counsel can literally set up an enclave of justice in a state where there really isn't any justice. So the best lawyers are ones who are familiar with all these mechanisms. What a US statute for discovery can do for you. What sort of judgments can be recognized and enforced around the world. How to bring investment protections and the right to arbitration to your clients when they're going abroad. This, this is really um, what law school, I think, you know, is and should be teaching you right now is how to be a good global lawyer because all these things are very important. Um, being able to think strategically, not simply limited to the state you're barred in, but what is going on in other states around the world. And you know, all this seems very prosaic and uh, very complex, but in the end, though, we have to be able to write succinctly. We have to be able to state these concepts in very clear terms. So being a good global lawyer, you have to be a good lawyer first. Um, so that when you're dealing with a contract between Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan applying a global norm of justice, you can do so in very clear terms. Um, so it sort of all circles back to fundamental things that we learn as a lawyer, no matter how cross-border our practice is. So with that, I hopefully I provide you with a few anecdotes from my, my career and what I do and a sort of broad brush of litigation, arbitration, investor state arbitration. Um, and I think we have some, good, I ended quickly. We have some time for questions. Any questions? Yes? Thanks for this uh, presentation. It's all embarrassingly uh, new to me. Uh, but I would like to ask about the international arbitrations and uh, what role, if any, what we would call case law plays. Mm -hmm. uh, do the advocates make arguments uh, from cases to the draw analogies, and what effect do these have on the arbitrators? And in particular, do the arbitrators publish decisions with their reasons? Commercial arbitration tends to be um, closed. That's one of the draws traditionally to commercial arbitration is two, con two, um, two companies can settle their disputes outside of the, the light of day. Investment arbitration is exactly the opposite. The point being is that we are judging very popular acts, things that affect not only the state and the company involved, but all the population in that state. Transparency is very important. Um, so yes, everything is public. Er everything. All the decisions are usually public. Um, because they should be. If the population is going to be affected by the decisions these arbitrators are making, um, it should be a public decision. Now, case law. That's sub you can find a lot of scholarly commentary on this. They say no. There, there, there's no case law. There's no stare decisis. However, every brief, every piece of advocacy is all about the case law. It's all about an analogizing what has happened before to this case. Um, and arbitrators from all walks are affected by it. Of course, the common law lawyers are more affected by it than the civil law lawyers, but they want the regime to be stable and predictable. And when your only law is a three-word fair and equitable treatment in a treaty, that doesn't really tell you much. So the case law has to tell you something. Um, what, what has been, they, they call it, a, it's been a Darwinian effect. The good cases live on, the bad ones die out. There are some cases that are just known to be bad decisions. And you know not to cite them. And there are other ones that have been very good ones and have become the, the paradigm for what constitutes fair and equitable treatment. And academics have had a huge, huge role to play in, in that process of 
deciphering these very long decisions um, and helping figure out what are the core components of something like fair and equitable treatment. So, um, yeah, court decision, uh, previous arbitration decisions are very important. Scholarly commentary is very important, more so than in any sort of litigation that you'll ever be in. Professors have a big role to play in investor state arbitration, and I think an increasingly bigger role to play in commercial arbitration whenever, um, whenever arbitrators are resorting to things like non-state law, uh, what constitutes a general principle of law. And as, as Professor Kern and I have talked about before, what constitutes a general principle of law? What is the contours of estoppel under the general principles of law? It's not something easy to state where scholarly commentary is becoming very, very important. So uh, I think in this field, we're sort of all armchair scholars um, in our advocacy much more than you would be in the litigation setting. Yeah. Uh, what you're talking about here, both the investor state arbitration and the commercial arbitration, sort of sounds like this kind of extra national equity jurisdiction yep. that's arriving. Um, but that's not the only kind of international dispute resolution that the International Criminal Court in the Hague and you have the Alien Courts Act and the Dual Statute of Law and Nations. How do all of these things interact? Well, the interesting thing, the, the big differentiating point between investor state arbitration and the ICJ, for instance, is that's reserved for states. It's just state-to-state -state conduct. And I think that's why international law, in my view, sort of stagnated in developing up until the early 1990s because you just had the odd boundary case or maritime case between states at the ICJ. Once you started having individuals, private parties, invoking international law against states in investor state arbitration. Um, the case law, the jurisprudence started developing and it started creating a real regime of international law of what, what fair and equitable treatment means that the ICJ, for instance, would not have been able to ex explicate on their limited jurisdictional um, allowance. ATS, it's interesting you should, should mention that. Um, you know, the, the alien tort statute, you know, I, who knows what's going to become of it after Kiobel. Um, but do we really want a national court, national judges, um, expounding on what international law means? Uh, I say no. I, I say no. You don't want the, and this is no offense to the federal judiciary. I, I, you know, I clerked in the federal judiciary and I have a lot of respect for it, but you don't want a guy who's deciding four habeas petitions before he's deciding what international law is. Um, the specialists, the arbitrators, know this stuff better and are in a better position to, to develop what international law is than a national court um, is, is, um, is able to. Is that, what other forms did you mention that I didn't address? Uh, it was the international criminal court. Criminal court, uh, sort of the same thing. It's really state to state. Private parties have no right to invoke the jurisdiction of the court. And I think when you take that away, you take away an impetus for developing real jurisprudence on international law when it's simply a state to state mechanism. Because state to state cases, and I've been involved in pre precious few, are really. Um, they can be decided by or, or not brought on, for political reasons, for diplomatic reasons. Whereas when private parties are bringing the case, um, those diplomatic and political reasons sort of sometimes go out the window and the cases proceed and, and creates a better regime of jurisprudence around the, around the principles that we're, that we're applying. Yeah. Yeah. Well, remember that this is a government that is used to being a sovereign and is used to making sort of administrative decisions as a function. Yep. So the, sometimes, uh, what kind of counsel and legal representation do they get when they are planning things ahead of time, when they are actually used to? Because I mean, imagine if this is to be in English and they just don't have local counsel that know about arbitration. They don't know what to do, so they are either poorly represented. That was the case in the early 90s. Uh, most of them are represented by, by Magic Circle law firms, um, U.S. U.K. law firms. Uh, the 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 countries who are regular players 
uh, countries who are sued a lot sometimes handle the cases from within, from their own Ministry of Justice, who know this stuff pretty well. Argentina, I think they've had far more cases brought against them than anyone. Uh, they handle it internally. Uh, but most, most of them, most of the, the countries in investor state arbitration um, hire private counsel. And there are certain law firms who are well known to represent only states, uh, Curtis Malay being one of them. Um, White and Case does a lot of stateside representations. So um, yeah, yeah, you have a bar. You, you now have an investor state bar, like plaintiffs and defendants setting up um, within the regime. Professor Branson. Uh, I followed the Mexico Chevron. Yeah. I think it's important for the students to know that there are two sides to that. Absolutely. Case. Absolutely. And there are many people that feel that Chevron has been heavy handed, mm -hmm. is attempting to intimidate uh, a part of our order. And I don't want to take sides, but there are definitely two sides. Yes. Yeah. It's been a running front page. Yeah, I, yeah, absolutely. And I tried just to pull out the, the 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 crude clips that have been sort of accepted as not the more some of the more um, salacious ones. Um, but you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. It's it's been a, a, a very interesting case, and there are definitely two sides um, to every story. Um, and it's an interesting case. The point I bring up is that I, I, it's a very interesting case study in how the courts of one state are brought to bear on a dispute that is happening in the national courts of another state. Um, it's, it, I think it was, it was a remarkable explication of that, that really hasn't happened, didn't happen before that case, but now is happening more and more and more and more. Yeah? Uh, I want to ask about the uh, I'm sorry? I want to ask about the FCA mechanism. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a self-contained system, typically. What that means is, if you're under the, if you're, if you're arbitrating under the ICSID convention, which most of the cases are, there's an appellate mechanism within ICSID. So there, you can appoint another three, three arbitrator panel. Um, their really only mandate is to look at manifest errors. Um, so it's a very, very high bar to, um, to annul an ICSID case. I believe there's only been two annulments in the history of ICSID. Don't, don't quote me on that. It's pretty close. Very low. Um, but then once you're through that, there are, it's automatic enforcement in any state who signed the Washington Convention, which I think there are about 140 states. Um, unlike the, the New York Convention, you don't have the ability to challenge the arbitration award in a national court because the appellate mechanism is self-contained. Yeah? Uh, I had a question about um, your experience when you're in the domestic court, the section 1782 mm -hmm. uh, procedure in order to bring more evidence before the court. I was curious if, um, both in your experience with Chevron Ecuador and other instances, if uh, civil law countries are more Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. If you're if you're taking evidence in the United States for use in a civil law country, there's a chance there's a chance that the court in that other country is going to say thanks, but no thanks. We'd rather not see it. Um, but the point is, is you still brought sunlight to the situation. And sometimes the situations are so bad. I've been in cases involved, in not just a Chevron case where. If the courts don't take it, sometimes the investigating authorities take it. Sometimes the administrative authorities in that state take it. The evidence has still come to light. And some use can be made of it, um, not just in the courts, not just in the courts um, of the civil law countries. And it's also interesting, I think, of the way US courts are treating these, these sorts of mechanisms. Um, relevance, for instance. We all know what the standard for relevance is uh, in the United States. So, so the court will only allow discovery of something that is relevant. This is a strain of jurisprudence under 1782, courts have basically said, we're going to even relax relevance even further because I don't want to get into what exactly the tort of fraudulent misrepresentation in Kazakhstan means. So I'm not going to get into what is relevant to that tort. 
we're going to really just allow you to take all this, and we're going to let the CASA courts figure that out. It's really opened the door up of 1782 even broader to a creative lawyer. Um, but the point is, the point behind 1782, and if you read the Intel decision of the Supreme Court 2004, which is the only time the Supreme Court spoke on it, U.S. Supreme Court spoke on 1782, the policy is, is we want to, more facts coming to light is always better. We're one of the only countries with the tradition of broad discovery, and we would encourage other states to do that more. They really haven't. But if they're not going to do it, we're going to do it for them, and hopefully we're going to let the facts out much more. And this is the, the, the point behind 1782. So if the foreign court doesn't take it or just doesn't look at it, we've still met our goal of what we're trying to do here. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, it, 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 it can, it can. So in a blocking statute situation, uh, a U.S. court is going to restrict your discovery to what is here in the United States. And some courts have already started doing that. Some courts, even without a blocking statute, have started, um, started limiting 1782 discovery to what is here in the United States. So as the U.S. courts don't become a clearinghouse for discovery all around the world. Now, the point in 1782 is this is brand new. I mean, the statute's been on the books for 60 years, but there was a small handful of cases until the Chevron case, um, but now it's exploded. I mean, I do so much 1782 work, uh, it's, it's really exploded. So the jurisprudence is, is still very new. There's a lot of circuit splits developing, and um, a lot of people are saying, and I think it's probably right, that us lawyers are going to kill the very mechanism that we've created by using it too much and using it too broadly and courts doing the same thing, courts are starting to limit it. And the territorial limitation is becoming one of the hotly contested limitations. But there's also issues, e-discovery for instance. Where is that located, right? There's your server here and you can access your emails from around the world. Is that discoverable under 17.2? Most courts say yes. Um, so this is very new jurisprudence. If you start looking into it, you'll see there's not a lot of consistency that has developed yet in really the past five years. <coughs> yeah? Soft law instruments like the you know, to trial commercial contracts or yeah yeah that's all evidence of non-state law. That's all evidence of what these general contracting principles are. Hopefully not tethered to any one national court, um, national legal system. So the soft law instruments like academic writing can be good evidence of what the legal standard is. That's the exercise. That's the exercise. Try to aggregate and find principles that are accepted everywhere. It's hard to say accepted nowhere. It's not non-state law. It should be maybe referred to as all state law. Yeah, most state law, not all state law. We, we're not going to we're not going to put the standard too high. Um, this goes back to a very academic decision. What is a general principle of law within Article 38 of the of the ICJ statute? Uh, I'm writing a book on that right now, and more books could be written on, on that question. But the question of what is a general principle of law, it's what is accepted by civilized nations. That's what's in Article 38. That's a bit of an antiquated um, definition. But the point is, is what's sort of accepted in legal, established legal systems around the world of all backgrounds, civil law, common law, and all the permutations of those laws? Yes? Mm-hmm. Yeah, if there's a treaty. The, the treaty is the consent. So if you look at the U.S.-Argentina bilateral investment treaty, there is a provision, I think it's Article 9 of that treaty, that says we, the sovereign state of, of Argentina, agree to arbitrate all disputes regarding foreign investment before an, arbitra uh, uh, an exit arbitration panel. So that is the consent, and it's an open-ended consent to anyone investing 
in Argentina um, by merely as an investor filing a notice of arbitration you complete a writing a, an arbitration agreement via the treaty and that's what's remarkable about investor state arbitration is that for one of the first times I mean there's there's very few other incidents where international law provides a private right of action to an individual uh, most you know before this, this was all state to state but the treaty provides the the consent to uh, to arbitrate yeah hey, one more question about um, institutional arbitration a lot of you know, it's the ICC they have yeah. their own rules and set up and they give a lot of discretion about discovery and gathering of evidence so I was curious if they may just depend upon the particular arbitrator and tribunal but they have kind of taken on this greater discovery principle in their in the it does depend on the arbitrator um, and uh, I think we're seeing more openness to discovery as common law countries conceive of it in arbitration. Um, there was the IBA put out their recent discovery rules that are now uh, applied in so many arbitrations and they're they're much broader than, than, than what used to be in arbitration. One thing they don't have is any allowance for third-party discovery which is sort of where 1782 creeps in for third-party discovery. Uh, so while they've opened up discovery for the parties to the arbitration, third-party discovery is still sort of off-limits and where things like 1782 come in. And go a little bit broader, 1782 is not a unique U.S. mechanism. There's an equivalent mechanism in the U.K. It's judicially created. It's called Norwich Pharmacol, which is a judicial creation that is very similar to 1782. Uh, so it's not just us that are, that are using the courts to provide additional discovery for tribunals. Um, but you raise one other interesting point. One of the circuit splits, one of the big, you know, uh, sticking points of 1782 is whether it can be used for arbitration. 1782 says it can be used for use in a foreign or international tribunal. And that's been, foreign court is one of them. Is a private arbitration a foreign or international tribunal? There's an even circuit split on whether that's the case. Then you take it one step further. How about an investor arbitration? Well, that's set up by sovereign authority, set up by treaty. So that starts to look a little more like a court than just a contractual arbitration. Most U.S. courts have said that counts. Private arbitration doesn't count, but this is one of the one of the things. Do we want to use our courts to help out two parties who've just set up their own tribunal through a through a contract? Or should we use our courts to, to help that along? Um, some say no, some say yes, um, and also arbitrators are starting with the uptick in 1782 to sometimes put in uh, procedural orders saying, "Don't do it, parties, don't do it." Um, it's happened. I, I've been in cases where that has happened because they just don't want the added distraction of that. And I think that's unfortunate, but it's, it's the reality and that's what they're there for as arbitrators. Yes? Is arbitration That's another hot area. It's another hot topic. Um, there was one decision um, last year that was sort of class action-esque. If you want to look it up, it's called Abiclat versus Argentina, um, where it was a bunch of bondholders, of aggrieved bondholders of, of, of distressed Argentinian debt got together and sort of had a, we're all investors class action. Um, that's probably the closest it's come, but I, I would think that it's going to continue, especially in something like bondholders, right, where everyone sort of holds a little bit of distressed debt here and there. Um, before this case, it would take these vulture funds or sort of to, to get them all together and buy it all up and then bring a case. But that case was more class action esque, um, so we're seeing that development. Uh, it'll be interesting to see whether that whether that continues. The, tre the treaties that sort of established the state investor relationship. Have any kind of class action? No, there's no mechanism. In, no, no, there's no mechanism in the treaty. Most of these treaties were signed thirty years ago. Um, the newer ones are becoming much more much more um, detailed in what's allowed and what's not. If, as a lawyer, as a claimant's lawyer, if you could find an older treaty, you always like it more because they're very open, they're very broad, and there's a lot of room for, for a creative argument. Um, I, the, the case I'm going for in, um, the case I'm going to hearing for in London next week 
interesting case, and I think this shows the public and private international law come together. Uh, I'm representing a Canadian company suing Kazakhstan, but there's no Canadian Kazakh bit by that investment treaty. So we are suing under the Canada USSR bit and arguing that the that Kazakhstan is the successor state to the USSR under public international law. Uh, our co-counsel is Stephen Schwabel, uh, former head of the, the president judges of the ICJ, and so that that case shows how these public and private international law issues really collide. Class actions isn't one of them that has you know, such a private international law mechanism that hasn't crept into public international law quite yet. Another great article to write, though. <laughs> yeah? You have all these 3,000 picks. Um, yep. Is there any move to create a, a worldwide product multilateral? Uh, there are several. There's a, NAFTA is a trilateral. It's U.S., Mexico, and Canada. Uh, the SADC, the South African Development Community, has all of South Africa, all the Southern African states in a multilateral investment. The Energy Charter Treaty, which is 30 or so signatories, is is another one, and it has arbitration provisions in it. So yeah, there are, there are. So I think we are just about out of time. So but I'm happy to take any questions afterwards, and you know, I'll stick around. Great. So thank you so very much. And if you'll join me in thanking Mr. Chairman.